Hi, welcome to the workshop. Right, so while our fuel tank cleans itself, I've now got a chance to get onto these fuel lines on John's Garden Find Range Rover. Now, obviously, the plan is to try and get it to an MOT station and then maybe through an MOT test. But obviously, for that to happen, it's better to get it to drive and get it out of the workshop. Now, so far, we've established that the fuel lines are totally shot and they're also unavailable. So I needed to make my own and I've kind of opted for Cunifer, which is a nickel copper alloy. And the idea is that this is obviously much more flexible than steel, but also it's not going to corrode nearly as quickly. So it's probably going to outlive the Range Rover itself. Now, when it comes to what I put on the ends to attach the hoses, I have a couple of options. I've got a little thing like this, which will have an olive inside. And you just pop that over the end of your cunifer and then effectively you kind of crush it down that crushes the olive we're making a nice seal and then the bit the hose goes on to is this barbed bit on the end but as you can see they're quite chunky and obviously i've got to have one on either end of each pipe so before of those they're going to be really hard to thread through anywhere for one thing but also they don't look right they're not really how it would have come out of the factory so a much better option is going for a beaded end just like you have on the original factory fuel pipes so I've actually managed to get hold of a tool from the States and it was worth the wait, believe me, even though it's a very simple thing and it's relatively inexpensive. It's going to do a really nice job, hopefully, of putting this bead on the end of the pipe or on the end of the cunifer. And then that way it's going to be much more like stock and also hopefully it'll be easier to thread through. So my first thing is to actually try out the beading tool to see how good the bead is and then use that to try and push through all the pinch points on the Range Rover chassis to make sure it's actually going to be easy to thread through. Right, first thing, just going to get my cunifer. I'm going to start by just cutting a nice straight end on the end of that, just to be sure, because usually when you buy it, the first ends are a little bit raggedy. And this little tool, I just kind of just crank the blade in and the rollers sort of push back and eventually you end up with a nice cut on the end. I mean, this is pretty standard plumber's equipment. Okay, so then, once I got rid of that, then just use a deburring tool just to get rid of any burrs on the inside. The way that the blade works is pushing into that pipe, so of course that the burrs are going to end up on the inside. So just so that's that nice and clear. So then the next thing is a little bit of lubrication. Right, so now we're going to get this little. You can see it's like almost like a little finger. That's going to be pushing on the inside of the tube, and these rollers are actually going to be supporting the other side of the tube, but you can see inside them there's like a little dip. So effectively that's how, what's going to create our bead. So I just pop that onto there like so, and I'm just going to wind the handle so it's basically bringing that sort of little finger and the rollers together, and then just crank it down a little bit, and I'm just going to start moving it around, and you can see each time I just wind it a bit more, and every time I just tighten it up, it deforms the metal just a little bit more, and you see the bead starting to form. Now, I don't want to go too far. That's looking pretty good. So that's, I would say, looking much like stock. I'll just do a little bit, and then I'm just going to unwind it again. Move it out. And now, if I compare that to the original ones, you can see Look at that, it's not bad at all, is it? That's quite nice. So that's definitely going to work a treat. Quite impressed with that. And also, it's possible, if I've got enough space, I could do that actually on the vehicle. So the next thing to try is to see whether this is going to go through the pinch points. And if it does, then I can do it all outside of the vehicle. If not, I can do it once I've actually threaded all those pipes into position. So this is the main pinch point that I'm worried about, the bit that goes between the body and the chassis where those two clips 
are kind of one on top of the other. So what I'm going to try and do is just feed this through and see what the issues are. So I just get like kind of a through the pinch point. There we go. <laughs> and annoyingly, you can see my freshly formed bead is not going to go through because the pipe itself is about the perfect size for a replacement fuel line. Now on the side that's broken, you can see that that would be no problem at all. But of course, I'll just try and push it through again. I think if I force that, you can see, I don't think the plastic's going to give, I think it's just going to break. So really what that means is I'm going to need to have to put both fuel lines to sort of feed them through this pinch point into the back and then make the bead on the vehicle once it's into a sort of a free space. So I think the next thing I need to work out is exactly how much fuel line I'm going to need. Right, so the idea here is I'm just going to just lay out the fuel lines so I can see exactly how long they were. Only catch is that when I was merrily cutting them, making them a little bit shorter just to get them out from underneath the car, I did omit to notice which one goes with which length. And they are ever so slightly different. So hopefully I'll just leave a little bit of extra and that should give me what I need to get everything exactly right. But you can see these two on the end here, one's got a funny kink in it and one, of course, doesn't, but also it's therefore a bit shorter as well. So what I'll do is now just use just a little bit of wire and the idea is I'll just inch this along. So we'll start with a really long one and I'm just gonna literally run it all the way along. So it's kind of a little bit easier to handle than perhaps a tape measure. Here to there, and that one goes to here perhaps. Now this is this little strange sort of part underneath the car that seemed to be there for no reason at all. I've got one on both sides, which is kind of strange. So I think I'll accommodate that for now, just in case I do need to use that. But I suspect we're just going to try and find a way of avoiding that. Go to the end. And then this is where the pipes actually kink up into the engine bay and then kink further around as they then connect up to the manifold. And you can feel just by bending the pipe, it stops about here. So that is the length. I'm just going to mark that because you know how easy it's going to be <laughs> to drop that. So just pop that about there. And what I'll, I'll now do again is now go on the other one. So now I'm just going to go straight from the end, but I'm just going to continue along. I could probably guesstimate a bit more, but to be honest, it's just nice to know that it's about right. And again, probably it's about there. So now I have my overall length. I can now start to unfurl the conifer and then actually then make sure that I've got just what I need. So here we go. I'm just going to just sort of try and get it to come out as straight as I can. And then obviously by the time I've wrestled it onto the car, there'll be plenty of opportunity to sort of straighten it or in fact bend it where I need to. So it's getting a little unruly at the other end. So I'm now just going to Obviously, you hold that on the end there and just start marking out where I'm going to cut this. Or at least see where everything works out. I was considering unrolling it while threading it into the car, but I think, to be honest, it's going to get more complicated than it's worth. So, And also, it's interesting to see how it would come from Land Rover if we had been able to buy the other parts. And of course, obviously, they would have come probably in a very long, awkward box. So this would be quite interesting to see whether we can fettle it into the car. So what I will do is actually just add a couple of inches on both lengths of pipe just to make sure because I can always trim it in the engine bay where it's nice and easy should I end up with a little bit too much or I end up having to go a slightly different route. But one interesting thing, if I just grab the other end of this wire just to see if the pipes are in fact the same length or slightly different the way I've done it so far. <laughs> so they're pretty much exactly the same length according to my rough guesstimate calculation. So that's kind of encouraging. So that way at least I haven't got to worry about which pipe is which until we actually start connecting them to the vehicle. And what I will do is actually mark one of them slightly differently to the other one so I know that I can actually tell which end is going to go into which bit. So I also want my flow and I want my return. So just give it another sort of six inches or so. So then that's that. So here we give it two lots of six inches. Okay, so do that sort of thing. So we've now got our two lengths of pipe and because I've already got my bead on my first bit of pipe I think I'll do the same 
On the other, as before, just basically just get the deburr in there, get rid of any swarf on the end as well. And then this way, I can have a bead on the ends that are going to go up into the engine bay because there's less restrictions there. And then, of course, the unbeaded end will be the bit I shove down the back of the car and actually try and get some kind of joy once it's in position. Brilliant. Lovely. So, before I actually just stick them together, I'm just going to draw a couple of lines around one of them so I can then decide which one's going to be sort of return and which one's going to be the flow. Do that on the other end as well. What I'll do, in fact, also, is obviously where I actually sawed these off, it was just at the same kink as they actually went back up into the engine bay. So I'm just going to mark that as well. But also I've noticed, of course, you've got the sort of pipe stopping about here and about here. So they're sort of slightly different lengths. So if I then put these together and then because this has been screwed in, that's the one that's actually going to be the flow. So I'll pop that about there or so. And then this one is about here. So I'll then do that to about there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mark that as to where that kink starts. It's probably around here or so. I'm just going to take them together and then this way I'm going to know roughly where they should start moving up into the engine bay. And I'm just going to do that all the way along. And I'll leave this end a little bit more open because of course this is going to have to go through that pesky pinch point. Well that's all set so let's get it threaded onto the vehicle. So just feed it through. Now, my next obstacle is that funny little bit of box section that didn't seem to serve any real purpose. Now, there's a real temptation to actually just feed them through there because it'd be very tidy, but obviously then the fuel pipes would then be part of the chassis and the body, and that would be a disaster. So I'm either going to go on the outside or the inside. I'll just see if I'll start with the inside, because that's where it used to thread, and see how that looks. I might move it to the outside if it's easier for the flow. Okay, actually it looks like the inside is going to be a bit of a dead end, so let's try the outer edge. That's going to be a lot easier to flow. I think that'll be better in the long run. So, now I've got the fuel lines up on top of the chassis rail. Aha, and so now this is the pinch point that I've been worrying about, so I'm just going to try and feed that through. But once I've gone through that side, I then also have to then go over the top of the hump of the chassis and then through this old clip there where it's actually damaged and eventually it'll get to the fuel filter. So we're not a million miles away. I'm just going to feed a slightly longer one on the back, which is broken. And then the other one, oh, look at that, straight through, which is lovely. So now, unfortunately, now what's going to happen is it's going up, so I'm going to have to try and bend it as I force it. I mean, maybe the bodywork will do some of the work for me, but I might just give it a bit more of a wrench. I'm going to have to flush through the pipe because there's a bit of grit almost certainly going in there, but of course I need it empty or open at the end because I need to get through that very tight clip. Right, so I'm just going to drag these through. Let's have a look. Oh, okay, so we get there. So I've just got to try and get through this clip right there. Going over the top. <laughs> okay, so... What I've managed to do is actually thread these fuel lines in between the kind of the strut, actually, or the brace that holds the floor and the floor itself. So I need to just go back a bit, uh, maybe from the other edge, pull it through. So it's going very well, but um, it's nice and tidy, but not very useful. Uh, let's try and drag it through at the same time. <laughs> so, I've now got my two fuel lines here. So obviously that's our feed there. The line's still just about on them. So that's obviously going to go to the filter, and the other one is going to go back into the tank as a return. Now obviously, what I will do is I might just keep pulling them this way, because now, once I've got a little bit extra on this end, I then need to actually work out where those beads are going to go in relation to where this pipe obviously wants, wants to go here. So I need to sort of get it further out, put the bead on and go back into the right position. But also I want to make sure that the front end is behaving itself. So I might actually now, I'll have the opportunity of the pipes further this way 
I'll then try and get the front into position and just as it's going to go up into place, I'll then actually put the bead on at this end in the right position. So, getting complicated, but we're getting there, which is good. So now I'm giving myself a bit more room if I go to the front. So I can now see, so my tape here, what I want to do is ultimately, that's where that bend is going to start going, and that is about here. So I can go a little bit further, maybe just a bit further along. That's a bit better. So now at this end. So I've now got my bend position tape, if you like, in the right position to go up into the engine bay, which means these pipes are now in the right position to work out where I need to cut them off, ready for the fuel filter connection and, of course, the return that goes into the tank. And that clip, our pinch point clip, is holding the pipes quite nicely. The others, I'll just have to work out how I hold them in place a bit later on, but it just needs a small amount of manipulation. So now I can just basically mark out where whichever either of these pipes needs to go to connect up either to the fuel filter, in the case of this one here, and then the other one, I'll just work out where that's got to go for the return, and then I can actually cut the pipes, or well, certainly mark them, and then I can then pull all the piping along to give me some space to start bending the front end all the way up into the engine bay. So we're definitely making progress. I just thought I might use the original fuel lines to give me a bit of a helping hand here. So, if I just feed these over the top where they used to go, it's going to give me a bit of an idea where our new pipes have got to end up. So I know that this one here used to go into about there, give or take, and put that in like, there like so. So I can see that the return, well that's at a funny angle, is about I don't know, 25, 30 mil, just over an inch, sort of longer than the other ones. That's quite useful to know. And then, just as a frame of reference here, this pipe here actually sits right up in the top of the vehicle and then goes on to the fuel filter up there. So I think the main thing is I've now established that that has to be a little bit longer. So what I'll do is I'll just get a pen and mark those out. I might just try and mark it again from the behind as well. So now I've got my marks on my two different pipes and again because this one is my feed I'll put the double stripe on there again just so I don't lose it when I cut it down. Right so now I have a rough idea of where I'm going to cut my pipes just to be absolutely sure and I'll give a bit of attention to the front end of our fuel lines and I'm going to actually feed the pipes further back and then kind of like sort of bend them up into the engine bay and try and get that masking tape bend point into the right position and then sort of double check everything before I do any real cutting. But I'm still going to have to shuttle it back again and then go forward again. So it's a bit of faff, but I'd rather get it right than end up with some fuel lines that are too short. Right, so I'm going to try and now feed this backwards if it'll behave. Right, nearly. So now I've just got to get these little tips through there. So maybe a bit more. Oh. And the trick is to try and get them to sort of to bend up slowly, gradually. There we go. That's good. Oh, we're getting close. In fact, you can see our tape now is roughly in position, so we've actually got the bend pretty much where it should be. So I might just now try and manipulate it a bit further up and then just check lengths inside the engine bay. So just going to Feed it through is going. I don't want to clash with any exhaust or wiring or anything, but I think that looks pretty good. I'll just keep going. And now I've got to try and bend it back up round the corner and then get it through a little bit more. It seems to be going. Oh, there we go. Right. So now I might have to bend it a bit more, but I can see that my tape where the bend should be is pretty much in the right position. So now I just have to kind of bend it up and I think we're en route to a bit of success. Right, so, you can see now these are sitting nicely against the bulkhead there, and they look about the right length. But just to check that, I'm just going to bring in this original flexi pipe and pop it into position, and you can see there that it's looking good. We've got about putting it exactly the right length there, which means now I know that that's okay. I can actually go and cut where my mark was. I'm 
Right, well, first of all, thanks very much for watching. And if you haven't already, do remember to subscribe and then push the little bell button to make sure you get the notifications when every new episode comes out. And also, thank you very much for your comments and your questions. And I've got one here from Roger Jaminda. Basically, he's asking, what make are all these orange toolboxes I've got all over the workshop? Are they any good? And did I get them painted? Well, the answer is, I got them from a company called Bot, and they're based in Cornwall in the UK. And all these cabinets are made to order, so you do get to choose your color at that point of manufacture. But of course, I wanted something slightly different. So they got their paint supplier, Axo Noble, to rustle up this very special orange just for me. Now, as you've no doubt noticed, I use them for all kinds of stuff around the workshop, including dropping things like engines and fuel tanks and stuff on top of them, because they are very strong. Strong. And because they have wheels, I can wheel that thing all over the workshop. They are rather good. So to answer your question, I have them because they are very strong indeed, but also I did have them made in my own special colour. Now I've got some good news. The hardback is now back in stock, so all of those back orders should now be cleared. But also, a lot of you <laughs> having gone to the trouble of actually sourcing our new mugs are now asking about the design of this for the t-shirt. The can't argue with stupid, and yes, Maybe when I finally get the Range Rover out of the workshop, I'll get five minutes to get that sorted. So we have another question here from Peter, and it's a very good question. Basically, why are cars, when they drive forwards, reasonably quiet, but then when they go in reverse, they make a bit of a whine? Well, it's all down to the gears inside the gearbox. And in fact, when you're going forwards, you're using these helical gears or these kind of diagonally curved gears. And then when you're going in reverse, you're usually using these spur gears or straight cut gears. Now, the reason there's a difference is quite complicated. Now, back in the day, all gearboxes would have come with straight cut or spur gears inside them. They're very efficient and relatively simple and inexpensive to make, but they are quite noisy. And the reason for that is that as each tooth meshes with its counterpart, you get this slapping of metal on metal with every single tooth. And of course, that clatter is the noise you hear with a straight cut gear set. Now, over time, we wanted cars to be more refined, so we started to use helical gears. Now, the way they mesh is a bit more complicated, but essentially, you can imagine that the teeth kind of slide along each other in a kind of a diagonal action all the way down the tooth. So as they're going, effectively, as one contact patch moves along those teeth, then the next one actually starts to mesh. So there is none of that slapping. It's much smoother, much more controlled sort of action. Now, although that makes them quieter, it also makes them slightly less efficient because you've always got at least two teeth meshing at any one time. And also because of the way they kind of transfer energy with a bit of an angle, you end up with an axial load, a load that goes forward to backwards inside the gearbox. But those extra forces need to be contained by extra or bigger bearings. And of course, they need to be encased in more material, more gearbox. Now that extra weight doesn't really matter in a road car, but it makes all the difference in motorsport applications, which is why they often use a box full of straight cut gears, because either you can end up with a simpler, lighter gearbox design, or you can get more strength into an existing casing, or because of the efficiency, you end up just with more horsepower to play with. Now, as to why manufacturers still use straight cut gears in a modern refined gearbox, well, it really just comes down to cost. Now, when you think about the manufacturing cost of a helical gear is much greater than a straight cut spur gear, but also all your forward gears just need two gears, whereas reverse needs three. So it really is as simple as that. Manufacturers get to save a few quid and we don't really get inconvenienced by that little extra bit of noise every once in a while throughout our driving day. Well, hopefully that answers your question. And now my tea's gone cold, but I've still got to crack on with the Range Rover. Right, so now I'm happy that the front end is in the right position. I can now make the cuts where I've marked them. But the thing is, I need to be able to get the cutting tool and the beading tool around the pipe. And right now I haven't got anywhere near enough room. So what I need to do now is just kind of tease the pipes along the length of the chassis just to try and get myself enough room. So I'm just gonna try and pull this along. It's obviously gonna bend the tube and get the front a little bit, but that's okay, this stuff's quite flexible. So I just need enough room to get my beading tool to get all the way around that piping. So first up, I'm just gonna do a cut here. So this is our return pipe. Just rotate it a few times, tightening. So every revolution or so, you can just feel the metal kind of giving way as the blade cuts through. There we go, fantastic. So just get the deburring tool in there. Give it a bit of a spray. And then get our beading tool in position. So. so the thing is with this, obviously if it's a little bit difficult to move, we can just back off how much you're trying to bend in one go. So 
a little bit stiff. So what I might just do, add a little bit more oil into the mix. All right, so that is that one done, I think. It's looking pretty good. So now we just do the other one. And the trick is just to do really gentle, sort of gradual compressions, as it will. We'll just wind the screw in very gently, just stretching the metal each time you go around. Right, so now I've got a bead on both of my pipes. I now need to get them back into the correct position to connect up to the fuel filter and the fuel tank, which means I have to slide the pipes along the chassis back towards the front. But now I've disturbed the front, I should double check that I'm actually kind of guiding that back up through into the engine bay. So a bit of wiggling at this end, and then a little bit wiggling further down. And I've still got my tape here just to guide me as to how far oh, I've got to go along. It's being a little obstinate, but that's fine. So we're nearly there, so just double check at this end again. So just then feed that through up there. So now I've got the tape just where I need it on that bend. Right, so now pipes are pretty much there, but if I actually look, I'm just going to jiggle it backwards and forwards a little bit just to get enough of the existing hose to connect onto the pipe. That's pretty good. So we can now start attaching it. But of course, obviously looking at the state of this fuel filter could do with replacing that as well. Well, this is our old fuel filter and this is the shiny new one but I can't use that nasty old bracket so I think it needs a lick of paint before I put it back onto the car. Now this is looking much better, a bit of satin black has done the magic again. I've also thought I might as well treat it to a new bit of hose and some more clips so first thing I'm just going to pop on the hose to the filter, well, I'll just then so you do up the clip as well, like so, it's good. So that sits like so, on the, no, it goes that way on the vehicle, so I'm just going to pop it onto there. So it'll even go to the trouble of a new nut and bolt as well. Now I know it's going to be really shiny compared to the rest of the car, but why not? Ready for our clip. Pop the filter into position. There we go. So our fuel filter is now in position. This pipe and the one for the return are obviously attached to the fuel tank. So now this end is done, I can crack on with the front. So our fuel lines are nearly there. Just to complete the circuit, I now need to connect up the fronts. And on that, we have some flexible pipes that go from the metal pipes to the fuel injection system. And actually, the ones that are on the vehicle are in good enough nick to use again, so I'll do that. All I've got to do is just undo the Jubilee clips and then just swap them over and just add a new one on the end there. Now it's easy to tell which is which, because the one here with the sort of threaded connection, that is actually for the high pressure side and this is for the return. There we go. Right, so now one last thing to think about is obviously this raggedy old thing is actually the heat shield that protects the fuel lines from the exhaust manifold, which is right there on the side of the engine. So I've managed to track down some of that. They're actually just a, a part that can be used in all kinds of engines. So it wouldn't hurt to have it a little bit longer. So I'm just gonna cut it in half. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just take these with me and then start putting them on the engine. feeling that I've gone past our freshly made bead. Now I can do up the Jubilee clip. I'll do this end first so I can then obviously put on the heat shield. So actually I'll just take that off again just to give myself a bit more room here. So it's going to feed this very simply over the top and then 
over the clips. And then this way, at least it's kind of back to factory and also it's going to do a nice job of protecting everything. So I'm going to just pop our Jubilee clip back in place. So I'm going to get, I can just about feel that return, but I can't really see it. So I'm just going to have to use the force. And then, no, it feels like it's gone on. I'm just going to make sure I've got it definitely all the way in position. And that's right, that's right. It's gone up against the stop, which is great. So now I can undo that up. And finally, we're just going to put on the feed. Right, so now our brand new fuel lines are connected up. We need a fuel tank. Well, ever since I mentioned that I was going to come up with a way of automating this, loads of you suggested a cement mixer, so here it is. Now, obviously, because the tank is so big, it wouldn't fit inside the cement mixer, so I had to contrive this apparatus so it could actually hang off the front safely and for a very long time. Now, because obviously all those bits and pieces inside are actually spinning around, I thought I might as well just get rid of kind of any extra bits we didn't need, so I've just cut off that old sender and also got rid of the rest of the old fuel pump as well. So. This thing has been spinning for just over 12 hours or so, and I am itching to find out if it's actually done the job. Has it stripped away any excess rust that's inside our tank? And obviously, the only way to find out is to get inside. And before I can do that, I need to drop the fluid. Just snip off cable ties. Okay. All right. And the glove. done very well. So the trick here is to get it into the container and not over the floor. Well, I'm pretty sure that's most of the liquid. I heard a few screws come out, but there's obviously loads more in there, and they're going to be a lot easier to shake out if the tank is no longer attached to my jig. So I need to just try and remove it. But I think the first thing I need to do is just get it into the right orientation to rest on my bench. So now our tank is free, my magical disc. So let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> now that is a classic. Many, many hours ago, <laughs> I popped the light in there so I can work. <laughs> and it's a little worse for wear, but it's still working, which is quite amazing. A little bit dusty. That's brilliant. <laughs> quite literally. You know what, I can't wait to see what's going on inside. So let's just get in and have a look and see if this has worked. John can go serious off-roading and everything will be fine with the fuel tank. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, that's much better. There's still a little bit of rust on the baffles, but you know what? <laughs> it's a lot better, and the sides are amazing. There's some bits that are super polished, peened, I would say. Well, I think that's as good as it's going to get. So all I've got to do now is remove all of those screws, washers, and nuts. Right, I think the first corner. Still definitely loads in here. <laughs> I think there's maybe one or two left. <laughs> see if I can get them out or even see them. Ooh. Yes, there's a whole gaggle just in the corner. You know what? I might use a magnet. 
Right, so now, got my magnet on a stick. Here we go. Yeah, just. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> okay. Ha. There's a nut as well. And a okay, last two, just under the seam there. Ooh, one. There we go. Look at that. Oh yes. Silence is bliss. So what I have to do now is actually wash out the tank with a bit of water and then to prevent some flash rusting, I then wash it out again with a bit of diesel and then we're ready to go. Right, well there we have it. So we have removed the rust from our tank, we've washed it all out, we've then given it a nice coat of oil on the inside so that fresh new metal doesn't have a chance to go rusty again before the tank is filled with fuel. And considering where we started, I'm actually pretty happy with our end result. Clearly, the more time and effort you put into this, the cleaner and the better the result might be. So if John wants a really spotlessly clean interior of his tank, he now knows what to do. Now I think on balance, as fun and as interesting this experiment has been, Really, if you're able to, perhaps buying a new tank might be the way to go. Right, well, I'll clean this up and get it into our Range Rover. Well, that's going to have to be a job for another day.